I'm Kento Bento. This will be part one of a two-part series. Thanks for some noisy. Possible by Nebula and Curiosity Stream. Tokyo, March 1970. 31,000 feet up in the air. Japan Airlines Flight 351 was reaching its cruising altitude. It had left Tokyo's Haneda Airport no more than 10 minutes ago and was set to land in Fukuoka in an hour's time. This was to be a relatively short flight, a domestic affair. But little did the passengers and crew Thanks know it was going state. to be neither, as Japan Airlines Flight 351 was about to undergo a harrowing ordeal. On the plane were 122 passengers, tourists, businessmen, first-year uni students, doctors on their way to medical conferences, really people from all walks of life, and including a few notable individuals like the high-ranking Pepsi executive, the talented bass player from the up-and-coming rock band Hadaka no Rarize, and the Roman Catholic priest from New York. <clears throat> yes, this was a diverse mix, with people of varied experiences and professions, but nothing, nothing could have prepared them for what was to come. D.B. Cooper. At about 7.30 a.m., as the DB Cooper fucking hops in here and takes this shit over. A young Japanese man got up from his seat to make a special announcement. Thanks to the Risa Barrow's pasta. He was hijacking the plane. Oh. This man was Takamato Tamiya, a 27-year-old recent graduate. Now, this announcement wasn't met with as much terror and panic as one would expect, as this was the year 1970, when airline hijackings weren't illegal. It wasn't yet considered what? an international crime. Yes, people were concerned, <laughs> some more than others. Well, it's not a crime. We can't do anything about it. Good work. Not how it is Loophole. Today. But this was about to change, as Takamato Tamiya proceeded to pull out a samurai sword. Ooh. Yes, a samurai sword. That is anime shit. The seriousness of the situation Jesus Christ! That's Batosai, the plane stealer! 122 passengers was a lot for a single hijacker, which is why he didn't come alone. With everyone now in a state of panic, Tamiya's accomplices began to make themselves Thanks, Miss Hockey. one by Thank one. you, Keyheart. The university students had revealed themselves. Now, this was unexpected and bizarre. Many of the students were still in their early years at Tokyo and Kyoto universities, two of the most prestigious universities in all of Japan, with the youngest among them being just 16 years old, actually still in high school. Just like their leader, Tamiya... Well, half of anime right takes sword, place in high school. Not, that. Some had not surprising. ...and homemade pipe bombs as well. This was confusing and terrifying. As they tried to break Thanks, the, the, cockpit, the distressed pilots radioed in for help, relaying the dire situation on board. It seemed it wasn't long until the hijackers would make their way in. The rest of the students were now tying the male passengers down to their seats as ordered by their leader. Now, it was certainly an odd sight to see such young Japanese recruits involved in this act of terror, nine in total. But the most surprising of all, perhaps, was the identity of one particular hijacker. He was the bass player <gasps> of the up-and-coming rock band Hadaka no Rarise. Oh shit! It wasn't a joke. His name was Moriyaki Wakabayashi, and he was in it just as much as his fellow comrades. It was time to end things. With the cockpit finally breached and the pilots restrained, the samurai skyjackers were now in full control of Japan Airlines Flight 351. And now, they played a fucking crazy concert. So lax ...as to allow samurai swords, pistols, and pipe bombs to be this easily smuggled onto a plane. But 1970 was a different time, and well, the demands of the hijackers reflected that. You see, the reason they took control of the plane was to fly it across the Pacific Ocean to the Caribbean, specifically to Havana, Cuba. This was to be their Why? final destination. With Cuba being a communist haven led by revolutionary Fidel Castro, the nine men wanted to make a grand political statement to the world, hijacking what? a passenger airliner right out of Tokyo and diverting it to Cuba, the country of their dreams. As members of the Japanese what? Red Army Very Action, surprising. communist what? militant group hell-bent on overthrowing the Japanese government and the monarchy, they wanted to establish contact with revolutionary forces in Cuba so that they could receive specialized military training for the impending Thanks, revolutionary little bean and war Victel. they would wage upon returning to Japan. The bit to they claimed they loved their country, and this was the only way. But on top of that, they were hoping mm. the act would inspire and promote rebellion across the rest of Asia. And this was just the beginning. Really, they wanted to start a world revolution, and they were willing to advocate it through terror and violence. After all, they had already long threatened to wage civil war in Tokyo and Osaka, and had previously been involved in violent street battles and a few small-scale bombings. Hijackings were their next venture, and these nine men, young men, were the frontrunners. They had been targeted and scouted from leftist student groups from universities across Tokyo and Kyoto, 
and were now ready and willing to give everything to the core. This is a and wild yes, story. included Moriaki Wakabayashi, the bass player of the rock group Hadaka no Rizu, which started off as a university band before their rise in popularity. Now, perhaps it was this very youthful inexperience and overconfidence that led to their first lapse in judgment, which awkwardly enough had to be explained to them by the pilot. You see, it was just not possible for the plane to make it all the way to Cuba, not even close. Why? Well, Japan Airlines Flight 351 was a Boeing 727 airliner, which was designed for short to medium range flights only, not for one making its way halfway across the world in a single trip. The plane was simply not- We'll fuel it with music. Pacific, much less to Cuba. And this was shocking to the hijackers, as they simply hadn't expected this turn of events. Thanks they five gift subs, geek. Fast, one that involved an alternate destination. But, well, even that appeared to be out of the question, as the pilots quickly informed them of an even more pressing concern. The plane was running out of fuel. <laughs> and they only had enough for the original destination, Fukuoka. Tamiya had to think on his feet. Time was ticking. Right, well, if they had to land in Fukuoka, then they'd land in Fukuoka. But on their terms. Yeah, this is this is our landing. The Japanese Ministry of Transport. We did this one. Hijacking and was entrusted with the task of ensuring the safety the of all the passengers. A member of the department, Vice Minister Shinjiro Yamamura, would directly oversee the hostage recovery efforts. Of course, word also got around to the news outlets, who quickly reported on the incident live. This was a first for Japan, as never before had they experienced the hijacking of an airplane. This shocked and horrified the entire nation. At 9 a.m., Japan Airlines Flight 351 touched down at Fukuoka Airport, where they were met by a horde of spectators and members of the media. Wow, the it's like no celebrities. In surrounding the plane as they ready themselves for the eventual standoff. With 129 hostages on board, 100. They have an actual sword fight. Crew members, the hijackers felt that they had the upper hand, but it all would rest on the negotiations. As Yamamura and the authorities prepared themselves, the negotiations began. For the next few hours, the two sides went back and forth, both unwilling to budge, with Tamiya threatening to kill every last one of the hostages if his demands weren't met. This was an intense negotiation, with a lot at stake, but eventually, an agreement was reached. So the deal was for the hijackers to release 23 of the passengers in exchange for more fuel, but it had to be enough fuel to get them to their new destination. Now, Havana, Cuba, was no longer an option. It was too far, so they had to settle for one within reach. After much discussion and consideration, they decided on Pyongyang. The hijackers were going to North Korea. Whoa. Now, this made sense to the nine men, as Whoa. North Korea was another communist regime, ruled by another great revolutionary, Kim Il-sung, grandfather to this Kim Il-sung. This is Moon, nuts. They reasoned that flying the plane to Pyongyang would still make a grand political statement to the world. Thanks, Reese and Frankel. Furthermore, they had actually already planned for a brief stopover in Pyongyang, as the city had been a All serious man, candidate Doik. to host their base of operations for their international revolution, and they wanted to conduct some reconnaissance while en route to Cuba. So all this just meant a slightly longer detour to North Korea. No big deal, really. Once the dust had settled, they'd figure out another way to Cuba. Viva la revolution. And so the deal was done. Tamiya got what he wanted, and even better, they still had 106 hostages on board for leverage. On the Japanese side, all the passengers released were women, children. Kim Il Sung young, gets on the plane old, next. Which was fortunate. Picks up a samurai not sword. Quite what they had hoped for. The majority on the plane were still very much in jeopardy. But now it was time to go. With the pilots having never flown to North Korea and unable to rely on Pyongyang air control for guidance, Fukuoka airport officials had to quickly pass them a map of the Korean peninsula. Thanks the resub for themselves. Losing internet. That would have to do for now. But with that, Japan Airlines Flight 351 fueled up and took off bound for the Hermit Kingdom. Now, aside from the Japanese, there was actually one other group that was rather unhappy with the outcome thus far, and that was the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. You see, Langley had sent over agents for their own hostage recovery mission, as there were a couple of US nationals on board, the Pepsi executive Herbert Brill, what? and the Roman Catholic priest from New York, <clears throat> Daniel McDonald. They had business to attend to. In what? Korea. But now, with the plane heading towards North Korea, a nation known for their international <laughs> uh, Pepsi guy? and political reclusiveness, not to maybe Coke planned this. Contempt towards Americans, things weren't looking great. By now, Flight 351 was well on its way to Pyongyang. It had crossed the Tsushima Strait, flown over the Korean mountain ranges, and had just about reached the DMZ, the Korean Demilitarized Zone. This 38th parallel is the contested border dividing the Korean Peninsula into North and South Korea. Once past this point, there would be no turning back. But on top of that, the pilots were having a hard time with navigation, as they were unfamiliar with the flight route. 
Seeing as the countries had no diplomatic ties, Japanese airlines and airport Thanks controllers to tier one, no were skill. simply unable to make contact with their North Korean counterparts. The Japanese pilots didn't even know where the airport in Pyongyang was located. Sure, they were given a map by airport officials shortly before leaving Fukuoka, but they were astounded to discover it was just a basic line map taken from a junior high school textbook. No. Oh. Little to no detail, <laughs> certainly no aviation. Map. What the, the fuck? Airport officials understandably had little. They just to condemned this plane. This was ridiculous. They said, "Fuck them." There was no way they could give them my North Korea child's homework. Map. Moreover, the North Koreans had no idea they were even coming. A major cause for concern. It's common knowledge among pilots that the airspace above the DMZ. Well, this is the 70s. It's not like North Korea could shoot it down. What are they going to do? Take spitballs to it? Entering could be shot down for any reason, with no grounds for redress. If this were to happen, it would surely precipitate an international incident. As such, the pilots tried desperately to make contact with the Pyongyang control tower, tier one, attempting Jer. to warn them of their unique circumstances. Hope you having a good night, HL2. Pyongyang, Pyongyang, please respond. Pyongyang, this is JA Flight 351. Pyongyang, please respond. Nothing. The pilots frantically warned the hijackers of the potential fiery end they could meet if they were to fly any further. But Tommy insisted they continue. He was steadfast in their revolutionary mission, even proclaiming that North Korea was no threat to them as he would personally recruit Kim Il-sung to the Japanese Red Army. It Makes sense. And so the pilots Pretty good had plan. no choice. With samurai swords pointing at their necks and with permission yet to be granted by Pyongyang, Japan Airlines Flight 351 entered the DMZ. And Kim Il Sung was flying around like Superman. Moments later, North Korean fighter jets emerged from the clouds. No gun! Fire at the passenger plane. What the fuck? They entered North Korean airspace. Holy shit! But just like that, it was over. Oh, the they only had stopped. six. They only had six bullets. The pilots realized, well, it must have been warning fire. At that moment, there was a faint response on the radio. This is Pyongyang. This is Pyongyang. Respond. Respond. It was in English, but in a heavy Korean accent. The pilots, relieved at finally making contact, tried their hardest to explain their predicament to the Pyongyang control tower. This must have sounded quite bizarre to the North Koreans, as nothing like this had ever happened before. But despite the unusual request, after some back and forth, Flight 351 was permitted to land in Pyongyang. Nice. They would, however, be closely escorted by the fighter jets. Now, the hijackers were elated. This was what they had hoped for, acceptance from their communist allies. But as the plane continued flying deeper and deeper into the reclusive state, it was becoming quite clear to the rest of those on board, the passengers and crew, that their fate no longer rested in the hands of the hijackers, but the hermit kingdom. Yeah, but they're, they're nice. At 3.19 p.m., they have Japan a Airlines Flight good history of being nice. at Miriam Airport in East Pyongyang, where they were met by a swarm of military personnel. There were North Korean soldiers, policemen, high-ranking officials, but also, surprisingly, sympathetic crowds of civilians. Yeah! Holding up welcome signs. Oh! Well a choir of schoolgirls singing North Korean greeting songs, welcoming the hijackers. What? Or, in the Damn! Eyes, defectors. Fucking celebrities! Outside the aircraft, an announcement could be heard, <clears throat> blasting over the loudspeakers. This is the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, presided by the great leader, Kim Il-sung. For those who are fighting against Japanese imperialism, we welcome you. This was a somewhat elaborate reception, and a magnificent sight for the student radicals, but for the hostages, it was deeply unsettling. It wasn't long until a North Korean official approached the plane to officially receive the foreign visitors. This was it. Tommy and his men were about to join their communist brethren. Now meanwhile, in a nearby hangar, the Japanese authorities and the CIA were getting ready to launch their rescue mission. It was now or never. All that was needed was for the nine men to be lured far enough away from the plane by the fake North Korean official. This was what it had all been leading up to. You see, the hijackers had indeed ended up in the Korean capital, but there was just one problem. It was the wrong one. <laughs> Back in Fukuoka, the Japanese authorities and the CIA failed to recover all the hostages. The negotiations did not go as planned, but there was absolutely no way they were going to let 106 Japanese and American hostages fly right into the heart of North Korea. This is nuts! They opted for the soul. This they is fucking nuts! Ended up in North Korean air space, Death so note shit! Think on their feet. Time was ticking. Right. Well, that is a trap card activation and a half for they sure. Land in Pyongyang, but on their terms. This was their plan B. With the negotiations over, they sprung into action. First thing, they needed to get the South Koreans on board. If they were going to pull this off, there needed to be exhaustive cooperation between all three countries. Japan, the US, and South Korea. 
something the hijackers could never have imagined. They had less than an hour to get this done. Now, on the plane, the pilots were attempting to navigate to Pyongyang, but they were astounded to discover the map they were given was unusable, a basic line map taken from a junior high school textbook. There was no way they could fly to North Korea with this. As the captain was about to throw the map away, he suddenly notices a handwritten note at the top corner. No aviation map, but tune into frequency 121.5 megacycles. He did as instructed. Not long after entering the DMZ, North Korean fighter jets emerged from the clouds, firing anti-aircraft shells at the passenger plane. But that was actually the CIA. That's who those on board thought was firing at them. In reality, this was the South Korean Air Force attempting uh, to oh, shit. into thinking they had now entered North Korean airspace. Having tuned into the frequency 121.5 megacycles, the pilots and the hijackers then received a message from who they thought was the Pyongyang control tower. This is Pyongyang. Respond. Respond. Spoken in a heavy Korean accent. This was, however, sent by air traffic control in Seoul. To this is like the most of big of brain plan it's ever. Known to the extent to which the pilots were aware of this ruse. Perhaps they were in the dark just as much as the hijackers, or perhaps they were key coordinators of the plan themselves. Regardless, what we do know is that following the instructions that were received on frequency 121.5 megacycles, the pilots were able to safely direct flight 351 back across the DMZ, eventually touching down at Gimpo International Airport in Seoul. That was the reason for the rudimentary map, because the Japanese authorities never planned for the pilots to use it at all. They were never going to Pyongyang. This is now, wild. The countdown was on. The hour was almost up. As the plane touched down on the runway, the South Korean airport officials were frantically putting the finishing touches on their makeshift renovation. You see, the final piece of the deception involved disguising Seoul's Gimpo Airport to look like one in Pyongyang. They did this by covering up any South Korean related items and branding and removing all South Korean flags, replacing them with North Korean flags. How Korean police did they do that so quick? In communist uniforms and North Korean military attire and random actors performing the role of the sympathetic public held up welcome signs in the hopes of putting the hijackers at ease. Uh, how? Some girls from a nearby school was even cast to sing North Korean greeting songs to add as much authenticity as possible. This is like the conclusion in a like a thriller movie or something. Blasting over the loudspeakers. This is the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, presided by the great leader Kim Il-sung. For those who are fighting against Japanese imperialism, we welcome you. The fake North Korean official approached the plane, greeting the hijackers with a megaphone. Thanks we to the gift subject. We shuttle bus to take you, the revolutionary heroes, to meet the great leader and premier, Kim Il-sung. The Japanese, American, and South Korean authorities, meanwhile, were waiting in the wings. Vice Minister Yamamura was ready. With the ramp stairs rolled up to the fuselage, the hijackers prepared to disembark. They were riding high. This was what they had been waiting for. After sacrificing everything to the cause, their moment had come. This was a revolutionary victory for the ages. One by one, they made their way to the exit. What they didn't know though, was that their struggles were far from over. This was only the beginning. Wh how? Now, they caught them. The em. rest of this incredible story will be covered in part two. Wait, how is there more? On YouTube in a few weeks. So make sure- Few weeks, no! But there's actually another video coming out even sooner that you can watch. What the, the fuck? Events. If you want to know all about what led up to the hijacking of Japan Airlines Flight 351, who the mastermind was, why Tamiya was never supposed to be the leader, how the Japanese authorities watched on as the hijackers boarded the plane in Tokyo's Haneda Airport, yep, they knew. Well, you can check out this special- This is the craziest story ever. To Nebula. It'll be coming out in April. There's a whole story to be told before they even step foot on the plane. And well, you can also check out there what many are calling my best video ever, the shocking Chinese pork bun murders, my Nebula original show. But warning, it's terrifying. All right, I'm fucking excited for the rest of that. That is wild. What a story. Oh, I don't wanna spoil anything, but I do wanna look up the people. Thanks to the resub unit, decaf milk, and the prime Dante. I'm built differently, I'm built